Pussy farts. <laughs> So anyway, now a lot of people already know this about me, but um, I don't talk about myself very much in my shows, not my style, uh, but I had an incident in traffic recently that I think I ought to tell you about, and a couple of things about me you ought to know first. I drive kind of recklessly, I take a lot of chances, I never repair my vehicle, and I don't believe in traffic laws. <laughs> traffic accidents, and last week I either ran over a sheep or I ran over a small man wearing a sheepskin coat. And I don't know because I didn't stop. I do not stop when I have a traffic accident. Do you? Do you? No, you can't. Hey, who has time? Not me. I hit somebody, I run somebody over. It's... I keep moving. Especially if I've injured someone. I do not get involved in that. I'm not a doctor. I've had no medical training. I'm just another guy out driving around looking for a little fun and I can't be stopping for everything. Well, let's just look at it logically. Let's be logical about it. If you do stop at the scene of the accident, all you do is add to the confusion. These people you ran over have enough troubles of their own without you stopping and making things worse. Leave these people alone. They've just been in a major traffic accident. The last thing they need is for you to stop and get out of your car and go over to the fire, because by now it is a fire, and start bombing them with a lot of ignorant questions. Are you hurt? Well, of course they're hurt. Look at all the blood. You just ran over them with a ton and a half of steel. Of course they're hurt. Leave these people alone. <laughs> Haven't you done enough? For once in your life, do the That's decent thing. Day. Don't get involved. <laughs> well, in the first place, it's none of your business. Simple as that. The whole thing took place outside of your car. <laughs> Legally speaking, these people you ran over were not on your property at the time you ran them over. Standing in the street that is city property, you are not responsible. If they don't like it, let them sue the mayor. And besides, it happened back there. It's over now. Stop living in the past. Do yourself a favor, count your blessings, be glad it wasn't you. And I'll give you a practical reason not to stop. You need a practical reason. If you do stop, sooner or later the police are going to show up. Is that what you want? Huh? Waste even more of your time standing around filling out forms, answering a lot of foolish questions. And by the way, who are you to be taking up the valuable time of the police department? These men and women are professionals. They're supposed to be out fighting crime. Stop interfering with the police. And besides, did anyone else see this accident? Huh? Are you the only one who can provide information? Surely the people you ran over caught a glimpse of at the last moment, don't you think? <laughs> so let them tell the police what happened. They were a lot closer to it than you were. There's no sense having two conflicting stories floating around about the same dumbass traffic accident. Things are bad enough. People are dead. Families have been destroyed. Time to get moving. <laughs> now, on the other hand, on the other hand, if I should be out driving around looking for a little fun and I see an accident, one that I'm not involved in, I stop immediately. <laughs> I, I want to get a good look at what's going on. I enjoy that sort of thing. Someone else is injured? I want to take a look. <laughs> Curious George. Oh, okay. People don't like that though, you know. Police don't like it. They say you're rubbernecking, they say you're blocking traffic. <sighs> never mind that shit. I want to take a look. I'm never too busy that I can't stop to enjoy someone else's suffering. <laughs> huh? 
I'll tell you something else, and you might not like this, but as far as I'm concerned, the bigger the accident, the better it is. Well, I'm looking for a little entertainment. You know my favorite accident? Two buses and a chicken truck. Get hit by a circus train in front of a flea market. Well, I'm looking for something entertaining. I want to see a neck sticking out of a gas tank. I want to take the time to stop. I expect a couple of fucking laughs. where I can't quite see what's going on, can't get a good enough look. I'm not the least bit shy about asking the police to bring the bodies over a little closer to the car. Bobby, oh, officer, would you fellows mind dragging that twisted-looking chap over here a little closer to the car, please? My wife has never seen anyone shake quite like that. Oh, that honey, that's his ribcage sticking out of the glove compartment. Thank you, officer, that'll be all now. You can throw him back on the pile. We'll be moving along. And off I go out onto the highway, looking for a little fun. Perhaps a tanker truck filled with toxic waste will explode in front of the Pokemon factory. <laughs> that indicates that the routine is over. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm usually running around with theaters and concert halls, and then I also spend about 13 weeks in casinos, uh, usually in Las Vegas, and I work there too. And during these shows, what I'm trying to do besides get a few laughs and entertain the folks is I'm working on material always, every night, for the next home box office show. I've done 11 of them, and that's my, yeah, that's the centerpiece. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't ask for applause, but I never turn it down, you know? I've done 11 of those HBO shows. It's kind of the centerpiece of my career. I did, a, I did one in 1999. It was called You Are All Diseased. I'm going to do another one in Ought One. Ought One. I'm going to do another one. That one is called I Kind of Like It When A Lot of People Die. All right. So I'm about halfway through the process now. Half of what you hear tonight is new stuff coming for next year's show, and the other half is the stuff from last year. Also got a couple of really new ones tonight. One I'm going to use these fucking cards for, another one I'm going to read it to you, don't worry about it. It's not instead of other shit, it's in addition. So you hear, yeah, 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 I don't substitute, I, I just add on shit, you know. So you'll hear a few things that are brand goddamn new, one of them nobody's ever heard of all tonight's fucking new. First time ever. It'll be the only time in this millennium it was ever done, which is kind of funny. Hey, you ever notice a weather vane on a barn? Do you ever look on the barn, they got a weather vane, they got a rooster up there, a cock, they call it a cock sometimes. You don't want to have a cock on a weather vane, because if they had a cunt, the wind would blow right through it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George, man. A lot of people don't know that. That's the big reason I travel around so much. I'm here to entertain and inform. What I think of as the complaint department, this is just a series of things that are pissing me off, okay? Things that are pissing me off. Because it takes... Because I don't have pet peeves, I have major psychopathic fucking disturbances, okay? And I tell you this, it makes the world a lot easier to sort out. First thing on my list tonight, airport security. Getting a little tired of this shit. There's too much of it. There's too much security at these airports. I'm tired of some fat chick with a double-digit IQ and a triple-digit income rooting around inside of my bed for no reason and never finding anything. Haven't found anything yet in anybody's bag. Haven't found one bomb in one bag. And don't tell me, well, the terrorists know their bags are going to be searched, so now they're leaving their bombs at home. There are no bombs. The whole thing is fucking pointless, and it's completely without logic. 
is no logic at all. They'll take away a gun, but let you keep a knife. Well, what the fuck is that? In fact, there's a whole list of lethal objects they will allow you to take on board. Theoretically, you could take a knife, a nice pick, a hatchet, a straight razor, a pair of scissors, a chainsaw, six knitting needles, and a broken whiskey bottle, and the only thing they're going to say to you is that bag has to fit all the way into the seat in front of you. And if you didn't take a weapon on board, relax. After you've been flying for about an hour, they're going to bring you a knife and fork. They actually give you a fucking knife. It's only a table knife. You could kill a pilot with a table knife. It might take you a couple of minutes, you know. Especially if he's hefty. But you can get the job done if you really wanted to kill the prick. Shit, there's a lot of things you could use to kill a guy with. You could probably beat the guy to death with the Sunday New York Times, couldn't you? Or suppose you just had really big hands. Couldn't you strangle a flight attendant? Shit, you could probably strangle two of them, one with each hand. You know, if you were lucky enough to catch them in that little kitchen area. But you can get the job done, if you really cared enough. Oh my god. So why is it they allow a man with big, powerful hands to get on board an airplane? I'll tell you why. They know he's not a security risk because he's already answered the three big questions. Question number one, did you pack your bags yourself? No, Carrot Top packed my bags. He and Martha Stewart and Florence Henderson came over to the house last night, fixed me a lovely lobster Newberg, gave me a full body massage with sacred oils from India, performed a four-way around the world, and then they packed my bags. Next question. Have your bags been in your possession the whole time? No. Usually the night before I travel, just as the moon is rising, I place my suitcases out on the street corner and leave them there unattended for several hours. Just for good luck. Next question. Does any unknown person ask you to take anything on board? Hmm. What exactly is an unknown person? Surely everyone is known to someone. In fact, just this morning, Kareem and Yusef Ali Ben Gaba seemed to know each other quite well. They kept joking about which one of my suitcases was the heaviest. And that's another thing they don't like at the airport. Jokes. You know? joke about a bomb. Well, why is it just jokes? What about a riddle? What about a limerick? How about a bomb anecdote? You know, no punchline, just a really cute story. Or, suppose you intended the remark, not as a joke, but as an ironic musing. Are they prepared to make that distinction? Why, I think not. Besides, who's to say what's funny? Airport security is a stupid idea, it's a waste of money, and it's only there for one reason, to make white people feel safe. That's all. The feeling, the illusion of safety to placate the middle class. Because the authorities know they can't make airplanes safe. Too many people have access. You'll notice the drug smugglers don't seem to have a lot of trouble getting their little packages on board, do they? No, and God bless them, too. Yeah. And by the way, an airplane flight shouldn't be completely safe. You need a little danger in your life. Take a fucking chance once in a while, but yeah. What are you gonna do? Play with your prick for another 30 years? Huh? What are you gonna read People Magazine and eat at Wendy's? Till the end of time? Take a fucking chance. Besides, even if they made all the airplanes completely safe, the terrorists would simply start bombing other places that are crowded. Porn shops, crack houses, titty bars, and gangbangs. You know, entertainment venues. The odds of you being killed by a terrorist are practically zero. 
So I say relax and enjoy yourself. You have to be realistic about terrorism. You gotta be a realist. Certain groups of people, certain groups, Muslim fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, Jewish fundamentalists, and just plain guys from Montana are gonna continue to make life in this country very interesting for a long, long time. That's the reality. Angry men in combat fatigues talking to God on a two-way radio and muttering incoherent slogans about freedom are eventually going to provide us with a great deal of entertainment, especially after your stupid fucking economy collapses all around you and the terrorists come out of the woodwork and you'll have anthrax in the water supply, there'll be sarin gas in the air conditioners, there'll be chemical and biological suitcase bombs in every city. And I say, relax, enjoy it, take a fucking chance, put a little fun into your life. To me, terrorism is exciting. I think it's exciting. To me, the very idea that you can set off a bomb in Macy's and kill 800 people is exciting and stimulating, and I see it as a form of entertainment. All right. I also know that most Americans are soft and frightened and unimaginative people who have no idea there's such a thing as dangerous fun. And they certainly don't recognize a good show when they see one. I have always been willing to put myself at great personal risk for the sake of entertainment. And I've always been willing to put you at great personal risk for the same reason. As far as I'm concerned, all of this airport security, the questions, the cameras, the screenings, the searches, it's just one more way of reducing your liberties and reminding you that they can fuck with you anytime they want. Anytime they want. As long as you're willing to put up with it, which means, of course, any time they want. Because that's the way Americans are now. They're always willing to trade away a little of their freedom in exchange for the feeling, the illusion of security. What we have now is a completely neurotic population obsessed with security and safety and crime and drugs and cleanliness and hygiene and germs. There's another thing, germs. Where did this sudden fear of germs come from in this country? Have you noticed this? The media constantly doing stories about all the latest infections. Salmonella, E. coli, hantavirus, bird flu. Now they have West Nile fever. These are all perfectly manageable diseases. But Americans panic easily, so now everybody's running around scrubbing this and spraying that and overcooking their food and repeatedly washing their hands, trying to avoid all contact with germs. It's ridiculous, and it goes to ridiculous lengths. In prisons, and this is true, in prisons, before they give you a lethal injection, they swab your arm with alcohol. It's true. Well, they don't want you to get an infection. And you can see their point. Wouldn't want some guy to go to hell and be sick. Take out of the sport, out of the whole execution. Fear of germs, why these fucking pussies. Can't get a decent hamburger anymore. They cook the shit out of everything now. Because everybody's afraid of food poisoning. Hey, where's your sense of adventure? Take a fucking chance. You know how many people die from food poisoning every year in this country? 9,000, that's all. It's a minor risk. <laughs> Take a fucking chance. Besides, what do you think you have an immune system for? It's for killing germs. But it needs practice. It needs germs to practice on. So if you kill all the germs around you and live a completely sterile life, then when germs do come along, you're not going to be prepared. And never mind ordinary germs, what are you going to do when some super virus comes along that turns your vital organs into liquid shit? I'll tell you what you're going to do, you're going to get sick, you're going to die, and you're going to deserve it because you're fucking weak and you got a fucking weak immune system. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you a true story about immunization, okay? When I was a little boy in New York City in the 1940s, we swam in the Hudson River, and it was filled with raw sewage. Okay? We swam in raw sewage. Now, to cool off. And at that time, the big fear was polio. Thousands of kids died from polio every year. But you know something? In my neighborhood, no one ever got polio. No one, ever. You know why? Because we 
swam in raw sewage. It strengthened our immune systems. The polio never had a prayer. We were tempered in raw shit. So personally, I never take any special precautions against germs. I don't shy away from people who sneeze and cough. I don't wipe off the telephone. I don't cover the toilet seat. And if I drop food on the floor, I pick it up and eat it. Yeah. I eat it. Even if I'm at a sidewalk cafe in Calcutta. The poor section on New Year's morning during a soccer riot. And you know something? In spite of all of that so-called risk of behavior, I never get infections. I don't get them, folks. I don't get colds. I don't get flu. I don't get food poisoning. And I don't get headaches or upset stomachs. And you know why? Because I got a good, strong immune system, and it gets a lot of practice. My immune system is equipped with the biological equivalent of fully automatic military assault rifles with night vision and laser scopes. And we have recently acquired phosphorus grenades, cluster bombs, and anti-personnel fragmentation mines. So, when my white blood cells are on patrol, reconnoitering my bloodstream, seeking out strangers and other undesirables, if they see any, any suspicious looking germs of any kind, they don't fuck around. I whip out the weapons, wax the motherfucker, and deposit the unlucky fellow directly into my colon. There's no nonsense. There's no Miranda warning. There's none of that three strikes of the round shit. First offense, bam, into the colon you go. And speaking of my colon, I want you to know I don't automatically wash my hands every time I go to the bathroom, okay? Can you deal with that? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You know when I wash my hands? When I shit on them. <laughs> it's the only time. And you know how often that happens? Tops, tops, two or three times a week, tops. something else, my well-scrubbed friends. You don't always need a shower every day. Did you know that? It's overkill. Unless you work out, or work outdoors, or for some reason come in intimate contact with huge amounts of filth and garbage every day, you don't always need a shower. All you really need to do is to wash the four key areas. Armpits, asshole, crotch, and teeth. Got that? bath. <laughs> Armpits, asshole, crotch, and teeth. In fact, you can save yourself a whole lot of time if you simply use the same brush on all four areas. Yeah! Real good. Extinguish their cigars and move along to their next abomination. 
white pussy businessman sucking on a big brown dick. That's all it is, folks, a big brown dick. You know, Freud used to say, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Oh, uh, yeah, well, sometimes it's a big brown dick. Asshole sucking on the wet end of it. But hey, hey, the news is not all bad for me. Not all bad. Want to hear the good part? Cancer of the mouth. Good. Fuck them. Makes me happy. It's an attractive disease. Goes nice with a cell phone. <laughs> so light up, suspender man. Then suck that smoke deep down into your empty suit. And blow it out your ass, you fucking cocksucker. Now, here's another question I've been pondering. What is all this shit about angels? Have you heard this? Oh yeah, three out of four people now believe in angels. What are you, fucking stupid? Has everybody lost their goddamn mind? Angel shit, know what I think it is? I think it's a massive, collective, psychotic, chemical flashback from all the drugs. All the drugs. Smoked, swallowed, snorted, shot up, and absorbed rectally by all Americans from 1960 to 1990. 30 years of adulterated street drugs will get you some fucking angels, my friend. Angel shit. What about goblins? <laughs> Did anybody blame in goblins? Let me hear about them and zombies. Where the fuck are all the zombies? That's a trouble with zombies, they're unreliable. <laughs> I say if you're gonna buy that angel bullshit, you might as well go for the goblin zombie package as well. <laughs> and here's another horrifying aspect of American culture, the continued pussification. <laughs> That's a word I had to make up. <laughs> the continued pussification of the American male this time in the form of Harley Davidson theme restaurants. What the fuck is going on here? Harley Davidson used to mean something. Stood for biker attitude, grindy outlaws and their sweaty mamas full of beer and crank, rolling around on Harleys looking for a good time, destroying property, raping teenagers and killing policemen. All very necessary activities, by the way. But now, a theme restaurant. And this soft shit obviously didn't come from hardcore bikers. It came from these weekend motorcyclists. These fraudulent two-day-a-week motherfuckers who have their bikes trucked into Sturgis, South Dakota for the big rally. They truck them in on flatbeds and they ride around town like you're just coming off the road. Dentists and bureaucrats and pussy boy software designers Get up on Harley because they think it makes them cool. Well, hey, Skizix, you ain't cool, you're fucking chilly. And chilly ain't never been cool. As long as we're talking about this peculiarly American plague of theme restaurants, I got a proposition for you. I think, I think if white people are going to burn down black churches, then black people ought to burn down the House of Blues. <laughs> Damn, what a fucking disgrace that place is. The House of Blues. You know what they ought to call it? The House of Lame White Motherfuckers. Unauthentic, <laughs> low frequency, single digit lame white motherfuckers. Especially these male movie stars who think they're blues artists. Ever see these guys? Don't you just want to puke in your soup with one of these fat, overweight, out of shape, middle aged, pasty faced, baldy headed movie stars with sunglasses, jumps on stage and starts blowing into a harmonica? It's a fucking sacrilege. In the first place, white people got no business playing the blues ever. At all. Under any circumstances. What the fuck do white people have to be blue about? Banana Republic ran out of khakis? The espresso machine is jammed? Who do you the blowfish are breaking up? Shit, white people ought to understand their job is to give people the blues, not to get them. It's certainly not to sing or play them. Taylor's secret about the blues, it's not enough to know which notes to play. 
you got to know why they need to be played. And another thing, I don't think white people should be trying to dance like blacks. Stop that. <laughs> Stick to your faggoty polkas and waltzes. And that repulsive country line dancing shit that you do. Be yourself, be white, be proud, be lame, and get the fuck off the dance floor. Now, as long as we're talking about racial harmony in our country, I want to mention a little something about language. You know, we always have a lot of little expressions floating around in the American vocabulary, little sayings and phrases that uh, well, they kind of get hot and popular. Everybody uses them here a lot, and then they get tired, and they get old, and you get, you know, it's really tired of hearing them. Well, these two I'd like to mention aren't quite that worn out, but they're on their way. And these two are about minorities. Uh, you'll usually hear them from guilty white liberals. The first one is, happens to be. He happens to be black. I have a friend who happens to be black. Like it's a fucking accident, you know? <laughs> happens to be black, that's right, he happens to be black. Oh, I see, I see, yes, yes. You have two black parents? That's right, two black parents, yes, two black parents. I see, and they fucked. Oh, indeed they did, yes. I see. So, where does the surprise part come in? I should think it would be more unusual if he just happened to be Scandinavian. And the other term you'll hear quite a bit is openly, openly gay. They say, well, he's openly gay. But that's the only minority they use that one for. You know, you wouldn't say someone was openly black. <laughs> well, maybe James Brown. Or Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is openly black. Colin Powell is not openly black. Colin Powell is openly white. He just happens to be black. All right. And while we're at it, when did the word urban become synonymous with the word black? Did I sleep through this eight or nine years ago or something? Urban trends, urban styles, urban music. I was not consulted on this at all. Didn't get an email, didn't get a fax, didn't get a fucking page. That's fine, that's fine. Let them go. And I don't think white women should be calling each other girlfriend either. Stop pretending to be black. And no matter what color you are, you go girl should probably go. Right along with you the man, hey, you the man. Oh yeah, but you the fucking honky. Now, something a little more positive for you, a little more uplifting. Don't want you to think the whole show is negativity. Something a little more uplifting. This is about a festival. Can't get much more uplifting than that. This is my idea for a new one. One of those big outdoor summer festivals. This one is called Slug Fest. This is for men only. Here's what you do. You take about 100,000 of these fucking men. You know the ones I mean, these macho motherfuckers. These strutting, preening, posturing, sweaty, hairy, alpha male jack-offs. The muscle assholes. You take about a hundred thousand of these disgusting pricks. You throw them into a big dirt arena. Big 25 acre dirt arena. You just let them beat the shit out of each other. For 24 hours non-stop. No food, no water, just whiskey and PCP. You just let them punch and pound and beat and kick the shit out of each other. There's only one guy's left standing. Then you take that guy and you put him on a pedestal and you shoot him in the fucking head. <laughs> they put the whole thing on TV. Budweiser would jump at that shit in half a minute. And guys would love it. Guys would volunteer for it. All you gotta do is promise them a small appliance of some kind. Men won't do anything. Just give them something that plugs in the wall, makes a whirring noise. They'll be busy in the garage for about a year and a half. And here's another male cliche. These guys who cut the sleeves off of their t-shirts so the rest of us can have an even more compelling experience of smelling their armpits. They say, hey Bruno, hey Bruno, shut it down, would you please? Shut it down, you smell like an anchovy's cunt. And definitely not for sharing. 
No kidding, it's the same kind of guy who has that barbed wire tattoo. You've seen that, haven't you? It goes all the way around the bicep. Just what I need. Some guy who hasn't been laid since the bicentennial wants me to think he's a bad motherfucker because he's got a picture. Ah, oh, a little drawing of some wires on his arm. I say, hey, Joe, you come around, you have some real wire in there, and I'll squeeze that shit on good and tight for you, okay? Same kind of guy that if you smash him in the face eight or nine times with a big chunk of concrete and then beat him over the head with a steel rod for an hour and a half, you know what? Drop like a fucking rock. And speaking of tough guys, I'm getting a little tired of hearing that after six policemen get arrested for shoving a floor lamp up some black guy's ass and ripping his intestines out, the police department announces they're going to start having sensitivity training. They say, hey, if you need special training to be told not to jam a large cumbersome object up someone's asshole, maybe you're too fucked up to be on the police force in the first place. <laughs> Two new requirements for getting on the police force, intelligence and decency. Never can tell, just might work. Certainly hasn't been tried yet. No one should ever have any object placed inside their asshole that is larger than a fist and less loving than a dildo. <laughs> and speaking of dildos, this next thing is about our president. The dildo in chief. Here's the deal of old Willie Jeff. That's what I call old Willie Jeff. Old Willie, he thought Kennedy was great, didn't he? Ah, oh, he thought John F. Kennedy was just a terrific president, wanted to be just like him. Well, Kennedy's administration was called Camelot, although it really should have been called Camelot. Well, that's about all he did. He came a lot. So Clinton was looking for a legacy of some kind. Maybe he ought to go with it. Well, come a little might be better for Clinton. Because that's all he did. He came a little on the dress, a little on the desk. Not a whole lot, you know what I mean? Let's put it this way. Clinton was no match for Kennedy in the pussy department. Am I right? Kennedy aimed high. Marilyn Monroe. Clinton showed his dick to a government clerk. There's a drop-off here. There's a really fucking substantial drop-off here. One uh, more complaint item that I'd like to register with you folks, and uh, then we'll kind of shift gears and assume a tone of voice that is really no different from the one I've been using so far. <laughs> but this one is based on the fact that you all know this, that, that everything in this country is exaggerated. You know, everything gets overdone. Everything gets overdone, especially by the media, but everybody buys into it anyway. It's just, it's just a big, it's our trademark. Exaggeration. And this, I'm, I'm just getting a little tired of listening to all this ignorant bullshit you have to hear all the time these days about children. You know, it's all you hear anymore in this country. Children! What about the children? Help the children! Save the children! You know what I say? Fuck the children. Fuck the children. Fuck kids. Fuck children. They're getting entirely too much attention. But I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, Jesus, he's not going to attack children, is he? Yes, he is. He's going to attack children. And remember, this is Mr. Conductor talking. I know what I'm talking about. And I also know, I also know that all these single dads and working moms who think you're such fucking heroes aren't going to like this. But somebody's got to tell you for your own good. Your children are overrated and overvalued. And you've turned them into little cult objects. You have a child fetish and it's not healthy. And then I don't want to hear all that weak shit. Well, I love my children. Fuck you. <laughs> Everybody loves their children. Doesn't make you special. John Wayne Gacy loved his children. Yeah. Yes, he did. Kept them all right out in the yard near the garage. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this constant mindless yammering in the media, this neurotic fixation, because that's really all it is, that somehow suggests everything ought to revolve around the lives of children. It's completely out of balance. Listen, there's a couple of things about kids you have to remember. Fine. First of all, they're not all cute. Okay? They're not, they're not all cute. In fact, if you look at them real close, most of them are rather unpleasant looking. And a lot of them don't smell too good either. Have you noticed that the really little ones have a kind of a sour milk and 
urine combination. <laughs> oh, careful. Stay with me on this. The sooner you face it, the better off you're going to be. Second premise, not all children are smart and clever. Got that? Kids are like any other group of people. A few winners, a whole lot of losers. This country is filled with loser kids who simply aren't going anywhere. And there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. Can't save them all, folks. Can't do it. Gotta cut them loose. Gotta let them go. Gotta stop overprotecting them because you're making them too soft. Today's kids are way too soft. For one thing, there's too much emphasis on safety and safety equipment for these kids. Childproof medicine bottles and fireproof pajamas and child restraints and car seats and helmets, bicycle, baseball, skateboard helmets. Kids have to wear helmets now for everything but jerking off. Grown-ups have taken all the fun out of being a kid just to save a few thousand lives. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's fucking pathetic. What's happened is these baby boomers, these soft, fruity baby boomers, have raised an entire generation of soft, fruity kids who aren't even allowed to have hazardous toys, for Christ's sakes. Hazardous toys. Shit, what ever happened to natural selection? Survival of the fittest. The kid who swallows too many marbles doesn't grow up to have kids of his own. Simple as that. Nature knows best. We're saving entirely too many lives in this country. Of all ages, nature should be permitted to do its job of weeding out and killing off the weak and sickly and ignorant people without interference from airbags and batting helmets. You're lowering the human gene pool. Just think of these ideas as passive eugenics. Here's another example of overprotection for these kids. You've seen this on TV and the news. Do you ever notice every time some guy with an AK-47 wanders into the schoolyard and kills three or four of these fucking kids and a couple of teachers, the next day, the school is overrun with psychologists and psychiatrists and grief counselors and trauma therapists trying to help the children cope. Shit, when I was a kid, someone came into our school and killed three or four of us, we went right on with our arithmetic. <laughs> 35 classmates minus four equals 31. We were tough. I say if a kid can handle the violence at home, he ought to be able to handle the violence at school. I don't worry about that shit. I don't worry about guns in school. You know what I'm happy about? Guns in church. Oh, this is a really terrific development, isn't it? I'm so fucking happy. Finally, it's here. Finally, we got guns in church. I prayed for this, oddly enough. I prayed for this. I did. I did. And I predicted it, too. A couple of years ago, I said, pretty soon, there'll be some fucking yo-yo Christian goofy guy with a Bible who will kill a rifle. He'll kill eight people, and they'll call him a disgruntled worshiper. Little did I know it would turn out to be an anti-Christian. That was a really nice touch. And I want to say my hat is off to the people of Texas for once again leading the way when it comes to the taking of human life. You know, they're always, they're always in the vanguard of this important activity, and here they are once again showing the way and finally going after the right people, the churchgoers. You know, oh, they're just asking for it, aren't they? They're asking for it. Hey, they all want to be with Jesus anyway. Give them a helping hand. Give them a helping hand. Are you a Christian? There you go. Say hello to Jesus. Want to see the Lord? There you go. Say hello to Jesus. Say hi to the Lord for me. Do the Christian thing. Give them a helping hand. Don't think they wouldn't do the same for you. They don't call themselves Christian soldiers for nothing. Here's another bunch of ignorant bullshit about your children. School uniforms. Bad theory. The idea that if kids wear uniforms to school, it helps keep order. Hey, don't these schools do enough damage making all these children think alike? Now they're going to make them look alike, too? And it's not even a new idea. I first saw it in old newsreels from the 1930s, but it was hard to understand because the narration was in German. But the uniforms looked beautiful, and the children did everything they were told and never questioned authority. Gee, I wonder why someone would want our children in uniforms. 
And by the way, it doesn't even work. I'm really happy to tell you that. It doesn't work. Right here in Florida, in a four-year period, that's a pretty good test. In four years, the kids who wore uniforms had twice as many fights and discrepancy reports. I like that. I like it when the social theorists have to go back to their think tanks and go... And one more item about children, and that is the superstitious nonsense that blames tobacco companies for kids who smoke. Hey, kids don't smoke because a camel in sunglasses tells them to. They smoke for the same reasons you do, because it's an enjoyable activity that relieves anxiety and depression. And you'd be anxious and depressed too if you had to put up with these pathetic, insecure, striving, anal, yuppie parents who enroll you in college before you're old enough to know which side of the playpen smells the worst. <laughs> then they fill you full of Ritalin, fill you full of drugs to get you in a mood they approve of, and drag you all over town in search of empty, meaningless structure. Little League, Cub Scouts, swimming, soccer, karate, piano, bagpipes, witchcraft, dildo practice, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they even have play dates, for Christ's sakes. Playing is now done by appointment. What about happened to you? Show me your wee wee and I'll show you mine. You never hear that anymore. But it's true, a lot of these parents are burning their kids out on structure. I think what every child needs and ought to have every day is two hours of daydreaming. Just daydreaming. Turn off the computer games and CD ROMs and the internet and just let them stare at a tree for two hours. It's good for them. And in fact, every now and then, they actually come up with one of their own ideas. Want to know how you can help your children? Leave them the fuck alone. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. It reminds me of something my grandfather used to say. He'd look at me and say, I'm going upstairs and fuck your grandma.
She told Ken Starr to go get fucked and she went to jail for it for two years. That's what I call a hero. I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something. Clinton must have thrown her a pretty good hump to get loyalty like that. <laughs> what really bothers me is people who squeal on their families. Parents spying on their kids and turn them into the police. And, and it's just run out of Nazi Germany and the kids are no better. You ever read about one of these kids who turns in his parents because they have a little bit of drugs in the house? Shit. You don't do that kind of thing. Think it through, kid. You don't turn in the people who are buying the fucking food. Think it through. People squeal on their relatives. Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, one of my personal heroes, by the way. Yeah. He was turned in by his brother, his own brother, for a million dollars. You don't do that. You don't turn in your brother. You don't turn in your parents. You don't turn in your kids, no matter what they've done. Whatever happened to family values? In fact, you should never cooperate with the police ever, in any way. Fuck the police. Yeah. Walmart. <laughs> yeah, they, they rely too much. You know, let them solve some crimes on their own for a change, these pricks. They rely entirely too much on unsolved mysteries in America's most wanted to get people to solve their crimes for them. They turn good citizens into vigilantes and bounty hunters, lower than a snake's ball bag. The mafia, the mafia knew how to handle squealers in the old days. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, there was a famous bank robber named Willie Sutton, who was wanted by the police. Had nothing to do with the mafia, he was just a good old-fashioned independent bank robber. He was wanted by the police. One day he's riding the subway in New York City, and a private citizen, some civic-minded prick named Arnold Schuster, spotted Willie and turned him into the police. But Albert Anastasia, a mafia boss, read about it in the newspapers and he had Arnold Schuster killed which is what he deserved, the yellow rat motherfucker. You don't help the police. When I was growing up, we went to the movies, we rooted against the police. Yeah. We rooted against the police and for the crooks, and I still do. I love the crooks. I don't care if they come to my house and kill all my family. I still fucking love them. I'd rather spend an afternoon with a crook than a fucking policeman any day of the week. Fuck the police. They work for the state. Don't you understand? They don't have your interests at heart. They'll plant fake evidence on you. They'll lie in court to send you to jail. You don't help the police. And above all, you don't plea bargain by turning in a friend. You, you religious people out there, on judgment day, when you see God, ask him if you can plea bargain. Tell him you're willing to squeal on your family if he let you into heaven. You know what he'll tell you? He'll say, go to hell. Go to hell, you fucking squealer. Because even God hates a rat. You know what that Jesus character should have done? He should have beat the shit out of Judas. That's all. Just beat the shit out of him. But he didn't because he believed in all that love bullshit. But you notice something? He didn't plea bargain with the Romans, did he? No. And he didn't squeal on the apostles either. He kept his fucking mouth shut and he took what was coming to him. We can all learn something from Jesus, even if it's not what we're expecting. So now you get the fucking bonus item. Now you get the bonus item. You know something that bothers me? The Ten Commandments. Oh, Does shit right. bother you? First of all, why are there ten of them? Huh? Why not nine? Or eleven? You know why it's ten? Because it sounds official. If it was the Eleven Commandments, people wouldn't take them seriously. They'd say, what, are you kidding? The Eleven Commandments? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> wouldn't sell, but ten. They go, oh, ten. The fucking Ten Commandments sounds official. Ten is one of those numbers that sounds important, you know? The top ten, the ten most wanted, ten little Indians. It's a nice round number people can depend on. So in the case of the Ten Commandments, ten is an artificially arrived at number designed for public relations effectiveness and maximum compliance. I'm going to show you how the original people who made up all this religion bullshit in the first place padded the list artificially to get it up to ten. It was a marketing decision. I'm going to reduce the number of commandments right before your eyes. First of all, let's review what they are now. 
I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt keep holy the Sabbath. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Okay. Right off the bat, the first three commandments are pure bullshit. Yeah. Strange gods, the name of the Lord, keep holy the Sabbath. What this is, is spooky language designed to scare and control people. The first three commandments in no way relate to the real lives of intelligent, civilized people. So we eliminate these three, and we're down to seven. Yeah. Next, honor thy father and mother. The obedience commandment, respect for authority. Once again, nothing more than a naked attempt to control people. The truth is, respect and obedience for your parents should be based on their performance. It should not be automatic. It should not be automatic. Some parents deserve respect, some parents don't, period. We're down to six. Now, in the interest of logic and efficiency, we're going to skip around a little bit. We're going to go to numbers six and eight. Thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not bear false witness. Stealing and lying. Both of these commandments demand honesty, so they should be combined into a single commandment. The honesty commandment, thou shalt always be honest. Simple thing, we're down to five. <laughs> Continuing, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Two different expressions of the same idea, marital fidelity. The only difference is that coveting takes place entirely in the mind. Personally, I don't think you can outlaw fantasizing about someone's wife, or else what's a guy going to think about when he's jerking off? <laughs> but fidelity is a good idea, so we're going to keep that basic concept, thou shalt be faithful. We eliminate one more commandment, we're down to four. See how easy it is? You see how these religious people were just trying to pad the fucking list? Next, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. This is another one of those mental sins takes place entirely in the mind. And it shouldn't be a commandment in the first place because coveting your neighbor's goods is what keeps the economy going. If your neighbor gets a jet ski, you want a fucking jet ski. Coveting creates jobs, leave it alone. So you eliminate that and we're down to three. Now, we still haven't covered thou shalt not kill, murder. So basically at this point, we're narrowed down to honesty, fidelity, and murder. But once again, when you think about it, honesty and fidelity are also two different expressions of the same idea, so we combine that into one big honesty commandment, and we're down to two, honesty and murder. Now, I've always thought that one of the problems with the commandments is that they're too negative. Too many thou shalt nots. Eight of ten of them include thou shalt not. I would have done it differently. If I was one of those religious guys sitting around a table making all this bullshit up, I would have said, Listen, guys, we gotta be more, gotta be more positive. We can't frame everything in negative terms. So with that in mind, here are my new improved commandments. The first commandment, thou shalt always be honest and true to thy sweetie. The second commandment, thou shalt try real hard not to kill anybody. Unless, of course, they really deserve it. That's it, the two commandments. Moses could have carried him down the hill under one arm. You know something, if they had a list like that, I wouldn't mind them putting it up in the classroom wall with one extra commandment. Thou shalt keep thy fucking religion to thy motherfucking self. That's what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's something else that bothers me. When I'm flying first class, and some guy from coach comes up and takes a shit in our bathroom. <laughs> So get back to your filthy coach toilet with the tampon sticking out of the commode. Don't be coming up here and leaving your disgusting super saver feces in our nice, clean, attractive, first-class chemical toilet. Well, I think most people know by now, coach feces smell much worse than first-class feces. It's true. It's unfortunate, but it is true. It's a scientific fact. It has to do with, with diet as it relates to income, social economics. The lower the income, the worse the diet, the more disgusting the feces. And the farts. And the worst farts of all in the whole travel experience can be found in the, in, in the economy section of any plane coming in from the third world. It is fucking torture back there. They have farts back there. 
there that could kill cancer. Especially in the last three rows. Because what happens is these planes get flying so fast that all the most vicious and lethal farts are pushed toward the back of the airplane where they build up pressure until they reach critical fart density. CFD. And the whole back end of the plane blows off and terrorists get blamed. Spontaneous fart combustion. And the FBI doesn't notice. The FBI doesn't know what they're doing. They're looking for explosives. They should be looking for minute traces of cabbage and broccoli. <laughs> These are the kind of thoughts that kept me out of the really good schools. <laughs> Reminds me of something my third grade teacher said this once. She said, you show me a tropical fruit and I'll show you a cocksucker from Guatemala. <laughs> no, that wasn't her, that wasn't her. That was a guy I met in the army. I always confuse those people. I want to tell you, I want to plug something. It's not something I've taken a, 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 a habit of doing over the years, you know, plugging something on every show, I don't do that, but some things mean a little more to you than others I wanted to tell you. Uh, when I got started, when I was first getting started, before HBO came along, came along in 76, I started working for them in 77. Before that, in the early 70s, I had an album career. I made 12-inch uh, albums, LPs, black vinyl, 33 and a third LPs. I made six of them at that time. I made six of those motherfuckers. The first four went gold. The first four were gold records. The last two weren't gold. They were more like, a, I don't know, a nickel alloy or something. <laughs> but since I own all my own shit, I'm really happy to say I own all my own shit. We took, uh, last year, Atlantic Records and I, we took all six of those albums and put them in a little CD box set with a bonus album. I'm only mentioning this for the hardcore nutcase jackoff fans. Casual fans, they don't buy shit like that. And I don't give a fuck. They don't have to. But the hardcore jackoff nutcase fan, he wants to know about this shit. And they're looking for a bargain. People always want a bonus, a free extra added complimentary bonus gift at no cost to the consumer. So that's what we got. A seventh fucking disc, an extra disc in there, and it's got 70 minutes of shit nobody's ever heard. Well, the engineer heard it, and I heard it, of course, but most people haven't heard it. Got a lot of strange shit from the 70s and 80s in there. And the reason I mention this, even though Christmas is gone, this makes a wonderful first communion gift. Yeah. If your child is going to kneel down in front of a priest and close his eyes and open his mouth, you might as well have him on the little other side of the story as well. They call it receiving. Close your eyes, you're going to receive. And the priest just gets shipped to another parish and the kid goes into therapy for 40 or 50 years. It's a fine religion. Hey, listen. Sometimes, late at night, when I'm sitting home alone and the power goes out, you know what I think about? The first enema. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about the first enema? Because it had to be a first one. Everything has to happen once for the first time. Some guy had to think of the enema. And I'm sure it was a guy. Some guy had to think of that on his own. And then, he had to explain it to the other people <laughs> and test it. It's only a hypothesis until you test it. And then you'd probably want to do it to someone else. I'm sure you wouldn't try it on yourself. And don't you think you need to have a subtle approach? Wouldn't you have to be kind of subtle? Hey, Joey, turn around. I got a surprise for you. Let's turn around. Whoops, I dropped my rock. Would you pick it up for me, please? Thanks. Okay, relax. Relax. Take it easy. Relax. Relax. Take a deep breath, Joey. Take a good breath. No, free your mouth, free your mouth, Joy, please. Don't worry, it'll all run out of you in about an hour and a half. It's a new thing, it's called the enema. I thought it up today during lunch. Tell the truth, did you like it a little bit, huh? I kind of got turned on by it myself. You want to go again? Nah, I'm only kidding, I'm all out of pineapple juice anyway. Listen, I gotta go home and wash off my shoes. I'll see you a little bit later, okay? Guess what, Joey? We're engaged. I'm only kidding you. I'm gonna go, I wanna try this on my wife. She really liked that douche idea. Some guy had to think of that. Why? How? Why would it even enter your fucking mind? What are you sitting there one day carving spirit tips and fertility fetishes and you think to yourself, 
you know something? I think it would be a really great idea if I would squirt a whole bunch of water up my ass and then just let it all run out. How about I would feel a whole lot better if I did that? And it's at times like these that entire industries are born. Colonic irrigation. <clears throat> and I'm on. Don't I wait for? And I'm online. Electronic enemies, E dot in the mug. They'll have it. If you can make money on it, it's going to be on the fucking internet. Some guy's home tonight trying to get a mouse in his ass and figure out how that works. <laughs> ideas, innovation. That's what we're known for. I got a lot of good ideas. You probably noticed that already. Good fucking ideas. Here's something I'm going to do. I'm going to open an adult donut shop. Huh? Adult donuts. No one's thought of that. The donuts are the same, but the holes have hair on them. <laughs> People would like that. The police would never leave the parking lot. Right next to the donut shop, I'm gonna have a hot dog stand. For Gentiles. Hot dogs with foreskins on them. Well, the Jewish guys have those kosher hot dogs. They're kind of plain looking, you know. These would have nice little foreskins hanging off the end of them. And maybe you could even sell the foreskins separately. Give me a bucket of ten a dozen donut holes. I need a home to watch the playoffs. Good fucking ideas. I got a lot of good ideas. Sometimes the ideas fairly leap out of my head. Here's a great idea. I'm going to come out with this. This is a dildo that squirts gonorrhea germs. Yeah. Well, it's for the woman who doesn't quite have everything yet. Then you gotta have something for the guys. Guys get jealous, they want something to do. Here's something for the guys. You know the Chia pet? The Chia pussy. A little clay model of a pussy, you pour water on it, and the hair grows out. Then they got his Valentine's gift. Well, guys are always looking for a little pussy. You get one they can carry around with them. Good fucking ideas. I'm gonna open up a pool hall. You know what I'm gonna call it? Quit breaking my balls. Well, you gotta have a catchy name. You gotta have a catchy name. Brand names are important, you know that. You gotta have a good brand name. And brand names have changed a lot over the years. You notice that? They used to be kind of simple. Johnson & Johnson, Smith Brothers. Now you got things like, I can't believe it's not butter. And even they have a new one coming out. It's called, I sure hope to fuck the same lard. It's also a new instant soup, a new instant soup on the market. It's called, make it yourself, you lazy prick. <laughs> I think you ought to have a vacuum cleaner and call it the dirt bag. <laughs> Guys would love that. Hey, honey, where's the dirt bag? I'm talking to them. Well, if you can have a shoe store called Athlete's Foot, why can't you have a sporting goods store called Crotch Rash? <laughs> Names interest me. I'm thinking of moving to Nevada where prostitution is legal and opening a bed and breakfast called the Cock and Muffin. <laughs> would you go there? You come there, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Well, there, there are some large, large organizations, I should say really large organizations, whose names are completely mixed up. The Department of Water and Power. Well, water and power don't go together. You get fucking electrocuted. <laughs> the food and Drug Administration. Eh, well, with most drugs, you don't want any food. Then that really interesting organization, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> do we even have to talk about this one? Bad combination. Here's what they ought to do. You call the police, the Department of Power and Firearms. Then you have the Food and Water Administration. That's what you need to survive. Food and water, you put them together. At least you have the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Drugs. Keep all the good shit in one place. <laughs> Well, let's talk about people's names. People's names can be interesting because sometimes they carry with them a kind of emotional baggage that comes with the name. For instance, think of the names of the founders of the great religions. Those founders' names still today ring with an air of mystery. Christ, Moses, Buddha, Muhammad. But the Mormons, Joseph Smith, not too impressive. Come on, we're going to Utah. Who said so? Joe Smith. Well, I gotta go take a shit. Drop me a post.
Coast Guard, let me know how you like it out there. Well, I was raised Catholic, and I'm still waiting for a new pope to choose the name Corky. Wouldn't that be fun? His holiness, Pope Corky the Ninth. Well, I think I have to skip right to nine to give him a little credibility, don't you? Somehow to me, Pope Corky the First doesn't command a great deal of authority. Names tell you a lot. You know this country's in deep trouble if we ever wind up with a president named Booger. Booger or Night Dream. You know that it's time to dissolve the Electoral College. And history, sometimes names affect history. I honestly believe there never would have been a Second World War if Hitler's first name was Floyd. Can you imagine that? I'm gonna kill 20 million people and take over the world. Remember the name Floyd Hitler. I think would have beat the shit out of him in Munich in 1931. And no one would have been afraid of Jack the Ripper if his name was Wally. Who's that? Who's all the loose? Wally the Ripper. Woo what a fucking goof. Wally the Ripper, indeed. <laughs> and Billy the Kid. Suppose his name was Billy the Schmuck. He would have been a lot less tense. Who's that riding in the town? Well, that's Billy the Schmuck. Oh, well, fuck him. And I know I would have gone hunting with Buffalo Shecky. Doesn't sound safe. Suppose, just suppose, there had been a really great composer living in Vienna in the 18th century, but I mean great, better than all the rest. Better than Bach, better than Beethoven, better than Mozart, but his name was Johann the Cuntlapper. Do you think they would play his music on the radio today? But now the New York Philharmonic performs the Easter Mass in C sharp minor by Johann the Cuntlapper. Considered Johann's finest work, it had a profound influence on another obscure composer of that era, Heinrich the Mule Fucker. Well, some people have dirty names. They can't help it. They have a dirty name. Think all the dicks and beaters that are running around out there, shaking hands with people. As some of you must know this, there's actually a NASCAR race driver whose name is Dick Trickle. Isn't that right? That's his name, Dick Trickle. Well, how do you go through life like that? Hi, I'm Dick Trickle. Fine, stand over there. Off the carpet, please, Mr. Trickle. Thank you. That help out a little bit, huh? Well, they look like pretty nice moccasins to me. But having your dick trickle, having your dick trickle is not nearly as impressive as having a Magic Johnson. Whoa, look at that thing. God damn, you scared the Rottweiler. If I was you, Mr. Johnson, I'd put that thing away a little at a time. You know, you wouldn't want to go and get a big knot in it now, would you? And Peter O'Toole. That's a double header, isn't it? Hey, if you're the double bit twins, don't bend over near Peter O'Toole. Now, on the other hand, some people have funny names. And they can't help it. They have a funny name. Do you realize how do duties mother and father are known as the duties? That's true, Rudy and Judy Doody. And Bo Diddley's mother and father are the Diddleys. Darling, Dudley Diddley. But how would you like to be at a party and have to introduce the duties to the Diddleys? Uh, Rudy Doody likes to meet Daddy Diddley, Daddy Diddley, Judy Doody, 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 Judy By the time we get finished with these four people, who shows up? How do you do these two sisters, Dee Dee Doody and Doody Doody? Well, I don't know about you, but I'd be drinking triple whiskeys and saying, please God, don't let fucking Rudy Kazooty show up tonight. <laughs> and didn't they have any funny names in the Old West? Was everybody out there really named Murdoch and Kincaid? Didn't they have any funny names? Hey, Dan, guess who's over the saloon getting all liquored up? Two Gun Flechtenberger. <laughs> Says he's gonna get even with Farley Flockenhocker. Killing his buddy Clayton Heather Flecker. Hmm? Well, I heard it from old Doc Peckerchair. You better tell Sheriff Dick Licker to get his ass on the line. Boy, there's gonna be hell to pay when Marshall Dingleberry gets back into town. Hey, there goes that dance hall girl, Fanny Clitpicker. Let's go get laid. Let's go get laid. Let's go get laid. One more of these.
nice funny names. This is also from the Old West, but this one has a kind of legendary background to it. Do you ever hear this idea that there were certain Indians in the Old West who were named for the first thing they saw when they were born? Makes you wonder why there aren't more Indians named Wet Hairy Pussy, doesn't it? God, you'd think there'd be a whole gang of those motherfuckers. Probably the name just never caught on. I want to do is about us, folks. This is about you and me. Little things, okay? Little things, common knowledge. Things we all know. In this case, things we all know about our bodies. You know, because everybody's body is different, but everybody's body is really quite the same. So there are a lot of little things about our bodies we all know, but we never talk about. That's what interests me. These, some of them are, are disgusting, of course. Some of them are a little disgusting. Some of them are, are appallingly revolting and degrading, even to the most degenerate person. So let's start right in with a couple of them. Do you ever get lip crud? Do you ever get that crud on your lip, that sticky film, kind of a gooey coating, kind of a cruddy, gummy, flaky, crusty shit kind of thing? Starts in the corner of your mouth, works its way on down your lip, and if it's really bad, the corners of your mouth look like parentheses. Do you ever have that lip crud? Well, you want to get rid of it. It's a real simple operation, isn't it? It's low-tech shit. Thumbnail, that's all you need. Simple tool, just scrape it on down. That's all you just scrape that shit on down. Fuck those people at the bus stop. If you know anything, they wouldn't be riding the bus. Fuck them in the mouth. Scrape it on down, scrape that shit on down. You scrape it on down, and you take it in your roll, rub it on the ball, and then you save that son of a bitch. I save my lip crud. I save everything that comes off of my body. Don't you, at least for a little while, don't you look at things when they first come off of you? Aren't you curious? Don't you spend five or ten or fifteen minutes studying something, trying to figure out what the fuck it is and what it's doing on you in the first place? Sure you do. You don't pull some disgusting looking growth off your neck and throw it directly into the toilet. You want to know what the fuck it is. Besides, you never know when you're going to need parts. Isn't that true? Do you ever see these guys on TV? They're in the hospital. One guy's waiting for a kidney, another guy's waiting for a lung. Fuck you, I've got shit at home. I've got a freezer full of viable organs. I have two of everything ready to go. What do you need, a spleen and an esophagus? How about a nice used ball bag, huh? Come on, good condition. The owner only scratched it on Sundays. Come on, take a chance. I ain't got everything you need. Well, it's true, you want to know what something is. You don't spend 15 minutes peeling the malignant tumor off of your forehead just to toss it out the window, sight unseen, into the neighbor's swimming pool. No, you take a good long fucking look at it, don't you? Holy shit, look at this thing. God damn. Holy jumping fucking Jesus, look at this. Honey, come here, look at this. Honey, yo, hey, honey, hey, hey, fuck the rice a -roni. Get in here, god damn it. Take a look at this thing. This was a part of my head a minute ago. Not anymore, I pried it off with Pete Dinner and a Phillips head screwdriver. But look at it, look at the colors in it. It's green, blue, yellow, orange, brown, tan, khaki, beige, bronze, olive, neutral, black, off black, champagne, gold, Navajo, white, turquoise, and band-aid color. Plus, it's exactly the same shape as Bosnia. If you leave out that little section where the Croatians live. I'm not throwing this bastard away, it might become a collectible. Call those people on eBay, we can make some fucking money on this thing. Well, it's just natural curiosity. You all have it, everybody's got it. You're curious about yourself, you're curious about your body, so you're curious about little parts that come off of you. Toenail clippings are a good example. Toenail clippings, I'll even set the scene for you. You're sitting on the bed at home one night and something really shitty comes on TV. Like a regularly scheduled primetime network program. You say, well, I'm not gonna watch Raymond Blows the Milkman. I'm gonna clip your fucking toenails. So, you start to clip your toenails, and every time you clip one of them, the clipping part flies far away. Give it a second. Boom! 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 These things fly all over the bed. And when you're finished clipping, you have to gather them all back into a little pile, don't you? Yeah, you can't leave them on the bed. They make little holes in your legs. You don't need that shit. Gather them all back into a little pile, and you ever notice this? The bigger the pile gets, the more pride you have in the pile. Look at this shit, honey. The biggest pile of toenail clippings we've had in this house since the day the big bopper died. Call the Smithsonian Institution. Tell them we have a great idea for a new exhibit. Then you look for the largest toenail clipping of all, the biggest one you can find, and you bend it for a while, don't you? Don't you play with it and squeeze it? Yes, you do. You have to. You have to. Why? Because you can. Because it's still lively and viable. There's moisture in it. It just came off of your body. It's almost alive. Do you ever try to save your toenail clippings overnight? Do you ever put them in the ashtray and try to save them till the morning? It's no good, they're too dry, you can't bend them in the morning. Fuck them, throw them away. Who needs unbendable toenails?
It's not me. Bullshit. Fuck you up yours. Get laid. Eat shit. Drop dead. Jack me off. Suck this. I don't need parts that badly. I'm not that sick. I'm not that sick. Little things. Little things that come off of you and your curiosity about them. Especially if it's something you can't see while it's still on you. Know what I mean? You ever been picking your ass? You know, just idly standing out in the driveway, picking your ass. And you come across an object. <laughs> Honey, come here. Honey, you want a couple of hits off of this? Before it all wears off? Let me ask you something. Did we eat at Kenny Rogers' restaurant last week? I don't remember ordering anything that smells like this. I believe this is a shit burger. Actually, it smells like Dale Evans. Call that fellow Andrew Lloyd Webber. Tell him we have a great idea for one of those new shows he's always putting on. And then give me the scrapbook. This son of a bitch is going right next to that Hispanic toy jam we found at the Gator Bowl. All because you couldn't see it. But it was still a Klingon. Here's something else you can't see while it's still on you. Little scab on the top of your head. Do you ever have that? Sure you yeah. have. Little scab, top of your head. Not a big red blood scab like you get when someone at work hits you in the head with a fucking still syringe. <laughs> Just a little dry spot, a little scaly spot. You find it one day by accident when you're scratching your head. You come across it as if by good luck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoa, hot shit, a fucking scab! I love fucking scab! This is when I got out of fun. I can't wait to pick off my scab and look at it. Oh boy, 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 oh boy. I'll pick off my scab and I'll put it down on a contrasting material such as a black velvet tablecloth and run it to see it in greater relief. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to pick off my scab. This is gonna be a little... Wait a minute. It's not ready to come off yet. It's immature. It's still not ripe. It's not ready for plucking. I'll save this for Thursday. Thursday will be a good day. I'll have a half a day of work on Thursday. I'll come home early. I'll masturbate in the kitchen. And then I'll watch the Montel Williams show. And then I'll pick off my scab, oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to pick off my scab, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So you wait, and 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 you try not to knock it off by accident with the little plastic comb you bought in the vending machine at the motel with the two skanky looking chicks who gave you the clap that night. And now Thursday arrives and it's harvest time. Harvest time on your head. You come home early, you masturbate, but you do it in your sister's bedroom just to give it an extra thrill, you know what I mean? And then you watch the Montel Williams show. Fair show. Women have taken up the ass for 50 cents. Not the best show he's ever done, but you know something? Not bad either. And now it's time to go get this motherfucker, but you want to go carefully. You want to pick it off evenly around the perimeter so that it lifts off all in one piece. We don't want it to break into pieces. Who needs a fragmented scab? Not me. Bullshit. Fuck you up yours. Get laid. Eat shit. Drop dead. Jack me off. Suck this. I don't need parts that bad. I'm not that sick. What you really need, what you really want, what you really must have is a complete whole scab you can put down, study, look at, make notes on, and perhaps write a series of penetrating articles for Scab Aficionado magazine. Who knows, you might rise to the top of the scab world in a big hurry. It's a small community, and they need people at the top. I sense I've gone too far. So I could want to even, but I'll change the subject first. Did you ever blow a horse? No, not me, never blow a horse. One time I gave a reindeer a hand job. Well, it was Christmas, we were both a little drunk, you know what I mean? Thanks for coming here tonight, and happy real millennium. I hope you have a trip of a thousand years. Take care of yourself, have a good one, have fun. Take care, have a good one, see you later. Oh, Bobby, that was great.